Today is such a special Friday. Welcome everyone. Not very often do I get to introduce two of my personal favorite people in this world, and I would say my, my personal mentors. Um, we have Chuck O'Neill here for Commissioner Wilson's virtual Yay. office hours. Yay. Welcome Chuck O'Neill. Welcome. I'm so excited to have him here in this office. I think about all the time we've spent together trying to figure out how to advance policy that would benefit our natural world and the residents of Orange County. So it feels like such a momentous occasion having you here to visit us and to talk to us about what's really coming around the corner mm -hmm. to benefit not just this area, but also the whole state. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't tell you what, what a pleasure it is to be in this office number one and to be with uh, my two favorite people in the I, I was gonna say this is my two favorite people so, you know I mean there <laughs> the we love go is felt. Uh, we gotta get Hannah in here and he's yeah. honest in the room too uh -huh. so lots of uh, uh -huh. lots of love Ernest. yeah Ernest is the best yeah, Mr. Is. Friday now Mr. I will Friday. say before we jump into all this good news that we have to share um, if you, if this is your first time tuning into a virtual office hour, this is Commissioner Wilson's opportunity to share updates and just things coming down the line that people should be made aware of. But if you have any questions, you can dro drop them in the comment box right there, or you can email district1 at ocfl.net. Open door policy. This is the opportunity we really want to roll out there so that if there's something that we don't know about, it gives us an opportunity to dig in, um, you know, Kind of removing that veil of mystery around local government big goal and we do it every week it includes issues local issues state issues whatever we want to talk about mm -hmm. so nothing's really off limits and you know sometimes it, you things that come up here end up being you know we end up getting more information and coming back with about it so i'm hoping that's the case here that we can continue to have updates about some of the things that we're talking about as we yeah. get closer to election day um, mm -hmm. knowing that there's going to be not just obviously candidates on the ballot, but there's also issues that come up um, each time we almost go to a ballot locally by state. And so knowing all of those things and what, what is under the purview of your lawmakers um, versus what's under the purview of our, our, us as constituents and as residents and what do we have control over and what do we get a chance to advance, what's important to us. And so it sort of brings us to um, an initiative that is gaining traction, you know, widely across the state of Florida, because it's an issue that I think touches each one of us in at least one way, if not more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know I'm jumping right in. I know I was going to, I was uh, going to say, we'll get some background, but I'm so excited about talking about the um, this initiative that I really want to make sure that I'm giving it enough time sure. because it's fairly complex. So um, Chuck O'Neill, if you don't mind taking the floor here and just explaining a little bit about the Florida Five and sort of where it came from and where it's going and what needs to happen, what we all need to really understand about it in order to advance it. Mm -hmm. Sure. The uh, <clears throat> Florida Five largely got its genesis right here in Orange County. Uh, last election, as you probably remember, uh, on November 3rd, we got to vote on a charter amendment called the Right to Clean Water. And that uh, particular charter amendment that went through the Charter Review Commission, it went through seven months of uh, grueling uh, revision after revision, revision. And meetings. And uh, thank you so much for attending and offering your uh, expertise as an attorney. That uh, they got on the ballot uh, last year, and uh, November 3rd, it passed with an overwhelming majority, 89% of the vote, which is incredible. I mean, we, uh, when we were watching the results come in, uh, uh, David, a uh, uh, political consultant, and he said, uh, it's over 89%. And I'm like, 89% of the precincts? Right. Because <laughs> it doesn't sound real. I mean, you realize no, what a bipartisan like real... support you, you've got when you're 89% is unheard of. Yeah, that's yeah. it's, it's hard. I, I like to say that 89% voted for it and the other 11% didn't understand right. what they were voting no on. But uh, uh, so while we were going through this process with the Charter Review Commission, um, the state uh, 
pre or tried to at least they passed uh, a paragraph and a 111 page bill to preempt any local government from passing any ordinance that would give any plant animal or body of water any sort of rights and that so and i just gotta stop you right there because one of the things we talk about frequently here is the trend towards preemption the removal of local control and how un-american it is that we literally fought you know the revolutionary war to say that we don't want somebody in a distant land to make decisions for what's important yeah. to us in our backyard and here we are in central florida and someone you know in a distant county who may not have ever set foot in you know in the bokaiva study mm -hmm. area or mm -hmm. the bokaiva springs is getting to make decisions about how we protect those springs mm -hmm. yeah and you know the the actual representative who put this forward is a developer in citrus county and uh he is in the process of buying land that was set aside for a park there to turn it into a real estate development. So, uh, sounds like a conflict of interest to me, but I'm just a lowly commissioner <laughs> in Orange County. So, I, you think, I think that's the conflict of interest is really should be a, a subtitle under a lot of their names uh, in the state legislature. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, to think about some of the things that were preempted this year and you know without getting too far off track because i want to make sure we're explaining Wait, what, we're, <laughs> we talk for hours come on if we really could because understanding how many things yes that are being addressed with this initiative have in some form or another been affected by preemptions not just the right to clean water preemption and yeah. you know we think about what happened in the keys with their ability to prevent um you know mm -hmm. Uh, destruction of their coral, yes, the coral reefs and, and other, I mean, mm -hmm. it happens all over because of a special interest group writing the law and then taking that away from us understanding we're going to be feeling the biggest effects in our backyards. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Well, you know, the, it's easy for a special interest to basically buy a state representative and send him to Tallahassee to do their bidding. And that's, I think, what happened in this case. Uh, I, buy is probably a, a cruel word, but maybe maybe rent. Rent, uh, yes, you know, yes. For sponsor, sponsor. Sponsor. For I like term. the idea of it being like NASCAR, where they get to wear their sponsor's I, names. I don't think them. there's enough room on this guy for all those patches, <laughs> because he is, he is very popular with a lot of special <laughs> interests. So it's, he, will, he will remain nameless. Uh, so... It, they tried to preempt what we're doing. Before we even got on the ballot, <clears throat> they tried to preempt it. It passed uh, November 3rd. And overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly. 89%. I don't know if I said that, but <laughs> 89%. But uh, uh, that was November 3rd. On November 6th, a developer filed for a permit to destroy 100 acres of wetlands in Orange County. And uh, we have filed uh, an action, a legal action, to stop that and to stop the Department of Environmental Protection from issuing a permit right. to do the destruction and also against the developer. Right. Uh, both of those have answered with, <clears throat> I don't want to get too technical, but a motion to dismiss based on, based on the this preemption. Based on crappy law. Based on the or crappy French, law. Mom. But, yes. uh, well, I don't know any other way to say right. it. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, to that point, the idea of being given permission by a department called Environmental Protection is, you know, it's an absolute contradiction in terms. We've talked about this before. You know, I think the kindest description would actually be Department of Compliance. That's like my most generous. But there's no protection going on. There's no protection going on no. there when, when really it's an evaluation, like, you know, this, <laughs> this much evaluation mm -hmm. before giving a permit. And, and oftentimes the evaluation is done by a third party, a consultant who is then paid for by the developer. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's, a very, yeah. it's a very convoluted. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's the process. And 
the process is not working. It's not working. I, well, I, I mean, you can look all over the state of Florida, the, the troubles, you know, the, uh, earlier this year in, in Biscayne Bay, yes. and the manatee deaths in the Indian it's River tragic. Lagoon, uh, what's been happening for years with the Caloosahatchee River and the St. Lucie Estuary, and then now most recently uh, Tampa Bay. It's mm -hmm. tragic. Tons, tons of fish, tons of fish, dead fish piled up on the shores of uh, not, not just Tampa Bay, but along the, the coastline there, along the West Coast. Yeah. And, um, you know, what is, wh what is happening to this state? This is not the state I grew up in. Of course, I'm a, a couple years older than you, Lee. But 25? We, uh, <laughs> times, times a couple multiples. But uh, when, when I grew up here, we used to go to the beach. Would, we wouldn't even think about going in the water, you know, and going surfing yeah. or whatever. We never, you know, the red tide, no, we I'd never even heard of it, red tide, until much later in my life. Um, cyanobacteria that was just not present no. it was not present so yeah, yeah with, to uh piggyback off what you're saying about the Impar department of environmental protection if that's their job okay which i think that's disputable what Racist. their job is but yes. if their job is to protect the environment lee don't you think they should protect the environment well i've been asking myself that every day um but i i also just for those who are watching who this might be a lot of information they might not realize and i know i was one of those people not that long ago that thought we pay taxes so that the government can figure these things out and as a human being we have a right to clean water right i don't think people really understand where their rights fall and what the government truly is looking out on our behalf for. Mm -hmm. I think about every everything that comes through our agenda. I often, in the back of my head, I think about the places where those things became mass tragedies. You think about the children that in Flint, Michigan, that their local government fed, led to in their developmental years that will never recover. Yeah. And that was on us. That was on their government. Mm -hmm. So not only did they not do what they were supposed to do to protect them, yes, they poisoned them. And so it, it does require great scrutiny and in, in leadership and holding those leaders accountable. But right now, and, oh, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Right now, but, excuse me, before that passed, if something similar happened here in Orange County, is there any legal standing for human beings to fight that type of, you know, what, what's the difference between before and after having sure. this charter amendment passed? Yeah, and that, that's a great point. What's the difference? What changed uh, between November 2nd and November 3rd? November 2nd, uh, before it passed, in order to have standing in court, in order to bring a lawsuit in court, mm -hmm. and we're not going to try to get too wonkish here, but <laughs> In order to have standing to bring a legal action in court, you would have to be personally injured. injured. You, Lee, would have to be personally injured. And you would have to demonstrate your personal injury, right. which is so hard when it comes to pollution. That's yeah. Right. Because there are so many uh, bad actors out there that are polluting our waters and we drink the waters. And, you know, let's say, let's say God forbid, you get cancer or something. How, where's the smoking gun? There is no smoking gun. It's very difficult gun. to get a, to get the A to B causal relationship, a, a to, which is what you would need. You, you would need in order to have standing. So what happened on November 3rd is that, that you, as a resident of Orange County, could bring an action on behalf of that waterway for the violation of one of the four rights. And what are the four rights that we have in Orange County? We have... Uh, the, for waterways, the right to exist, the right to flow, the right to be protected against pollution, and the right to maintain a healthy ecosystem. So if one of those rights has been uh, violated, and it doesn't matter whether you live on the northwest side of town, like I do, and the infraction is on the southeast side of town, as in this lawsuit that I'm engaged in right now, because it's in Orange County and I'm in Orange County, I can bring this suit and have standing. And, you know, it, it, when you 
look up if you're interested in this subject and I can always share if anybody's interested but if you look up some of the most famous cases about you know severe pollution organizations or citizens that were trying to stop that pollution had to go and find the injured parties because oftentimes those injured parties are the most marginalized of our citizens yeah and so in order to find who is is suffering with the cancers with the lead poisonings with whatever it is by a group of citizens to say look we're going to have to have you come with us to prove that this has happened to the water well why why couldn't we just prove that with the water you know we understand that if you're doing this to the water that's enough injury that should be enough to say stop and so you know the idea is that inherently the water in the bodies of water um they are life they create you know they they create entire ecosystems and they should be protected in their own right um corporations have rights and children infants have rights so it, it, this isn't a, a really a novel idea and i think it's interesting that it's treated that way because really it makes so much sense when you think about that we can't we have nothing else about it Mm -hmm. So it's you know, mm -hmm. so it's so fundamental. Mm -hmm. And and you 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 might think, and I, I hear this quite a bit. I say, well, what about the Clean Water Act? The Clean Water Act really uh, enabled pollution uh, polluting entities to dump pollution into a stream, a body of water, so long as the concentration of the pollutant, the concentration of the toxin was not greater than the maximum contaminant level, which is the level that causes physical harm to people. But it, uh, along a river, for instance, if everybody, uh, industry or whatever, is dumping into that river certain pollutants, then we're really drinking a cocktail That's right. of, of toxins and pollutants. And it's what's, what's harmful, the, the, the level is what's harmful to humans, but there are other things that cannot uh, uh, tolerate, uh, wildlife, fish cannot tolerate the level that we can as humans, but they, you know, they, they have no, no say in the matter whatsoever. Exactly, and I think it's, you know, the idea of a canary in the coal mine, it's not just a saying. The idea of finding out what's poisonous was, you watch what happened to the smallest creatures. Right. And so this, right. you, the idea of making this, you know, the fish that we need, the fish that, you know, should have their own right to be there, right. um, or frogs or snakes or grasses that are a food source, that there are canary in the coal mine, if you will, is, a, you know, by the time those are gone. Yeah, yeah, and look at who the canaries are right now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, manatees, it's right? In the Indian, Indian, or the, the greatest number of manatees killed so far, and we're not even through uh, a year, by a year. Uh, now these are these are several hundred pound mammals yep. uh, that are actually larger, you know, uh, weight wise, mass wise than we are, and they're dying. Uh, you know, it's one thing it's to tragic. be a, ca a canary right. that's easily uh, uh, killed, but for a manatee to die, this is something that, that really there, there's something totally out of whack with yes. our system yes. of environmental protection. Well, and you know, the other, the other part of the Clean Water Act that I think is not well known is that if there's not a point source for the pollution, it doesn't count. So runoff pollution, which is such a tremendous component of what happens in Florida with our impermeable surfaces and our, you know, our, the nutrient loads we put in to, you know, recreational spaces as well as agricultural spaces become they're they're exempt those are not part of the clean water acts mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah oversight so yeah. you know it has to come always think about like the the pipe right it has to is a point source right. solution for the yeah. clean water act to be yeah. um, useful and here's here's a novel idea in order to clean up our water why don't we stop polluting right. it <laughs> yeah okay that's a novel idea right uh, instead of you know, I, I, I see a lot of backslapping going on in Tallahassee. Oh, we're paying a company uh, in Lake Apopka so much a pound to extract uh, phosphates, right? right? Uh, hundreds of dollars per pound. 
It's a, why don't we get to a point where we're not putting the right, phosphates any more in, there. <laughs> in there? Is that, uh -huh. is that too hard Chuck, to... <laughs> when I tell you that the BCC next week yeah. mm -hmm. has in the front of the binder some, some settlement for takings on flooding, and in the back of the binder a permit for wetland destruction. <laughs> a permit for wetland destruction. Yeah. And I, your head is just I, like, I think, did you see the front of the binder? Because in the front <laughs> yeah. of the binder, we're going to be paying a pretty penny for this because yeah. we did this before and it didn't work out, did it? Yeah. And in the back of the binder, like, we'll try it one more time. Let's go yeah. ahead and wait. You know what, what we're going to allow the destruction of the class one wetlands for? What? Hold on for this one. You ready? And then you're going to understand why my hair is turning gray under the dye. A retention pond. Yeah, they're destroying a class one wetland for a retention to pond. To build a wetland. So, and, and <laughs> you know, what's even worse than that is if you build a retention pond next to a wetland, yeah. if it's deeper than the superficial aquifer that's feeding mm -hmm. the wetland, it drains the wetland. Yeah. And Really, what's there's there's a, a certain pee and shell game going on with wetlands where you yes. put these retention ponds next to a wetland. So it was a healthy wetland. You put a retention pond or you dig a canal next to yep. a wetland, as it as is the case in the uh, packing district. Yes. Uh, so they dug a canal next to a wetlands. The wetlands drained into the canal, and then they come back and say. Oh, the wetland's not functioning. That's right. This is now, now healthy, we can now healthy, we can now develop we can, this. Strangely, we got some flooding on the other side of the retention pond. Right. Yeah. So weird. Right. So weird. It's, <laughs> so so this this charter um, amendment passed. Yes. The Sorry. state <laughs> was pulling some shenanigans, and Sorry. you what what happened next? Okay, what? that's the. I, I love Lee because she, she brings you track. back. I know. She keeps bringing, she knows it. Three she keeps days later, bringing you I back. I also do parties if anybody <laughs> wants to contract me out. Love you. <laughs> oh, that, that's a very good point, Lee. Wait, why, why the amendment? Because the state passed a law preempting Orange County, now we're going to the citizens of the state of Florida to pass a constitutional amendment to put it on the ballot and pass a constitutional that that basically preempts the preemption that that because the constitution is higher, higher. than yeah. state law that says a local government it, we're, we're, we're not saying that the state can't set uh, uh, regulations right. for environmental yeah. protection but we're saying that if a county that that's the floor and if a county says, we want to do more to protect our waters, right, that the state cannot say, no, you can't do that. You've got to come back down to the floor uh, 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 of protections. Mm -hmm. It allows local communities to do what we did here in Orange County. So uh, that's, that's the main reason behind that. And the other reason is uh, every other county, and, uh, you know, I hear... Uh, daily from other counties they're like how do we get that here yes how do we get that in Hillsborough yes. County how do we get that in Brevard terribly. how do we get that in Lee County and the you know we were going county by county with this and we said well look the probably the the best way to do this is to try to do it all at the same time with all the counties, all 67 counties in Florida. So it's consistent, so which is we, one of the arguments for preemption, by the way, is the legislature says, we need something consistent. Here it is, it's yeah, gonna be consistent. That's, that's, it, it we're saying, look, we, uh, you know, Department of Environmental Protection, if that's what you really are, go ahead, set the baseline. Right. And then, it, look, if, uh, let's say Washington County, doesn't want to do anything above the baseline that's that's up to them if if, if uh, uh Lachua county does that's up to them because all these counties have different uh ecosystems right. that they want to protect uh you know up in Alachua in in that area uh you have the springs in Chittucky and and uh uh, all That's those springs, home. you know, <laughs> Jenny so Springs. So they, they want to protect that. And shouldn't they be able to establish laws within the county that are 
aimed at protecting those springs. Right. And, and for instance, the Indian River Lagoon, they face, they face a surface water problem, not a groundwater problem like up in the springs. They face a surface water problem with all sorts of pollutants running into streams. And those people and know dumping. best what's going on right there, right and, there in their backyard. You know, we, we, we hear a lot from the legislature that they don't, they don't want a one size fit, fits all. Uh, they, okay, well, here you go. Here yeah. we go. We're going to give the right to the water. We're, we're, waterways we're giving sure. you what you say, you know, we should do, yes. which is tailor the solution to the individual county. And I think it's such an important um, component to where this came from, that the need was what drove this initiative, mm -hmm. that this was looking very much like, you know, local charter initiatives. Well, first of all, not all counties are charter counties. So that right. still leaves out a great number of counties, even if there wasn't a legislative, you know, slap down. Right. So, we're, you know, in order to really be able to you know, have all citizens engage in this and make a decision about what's going to what it's going to mm -hmm. look like to protect the waterways, this is the way to go about it. Could you quickly explain a charter county versus a non-charter county for those who are just tuning in and might not know? Orange County, you are in a charter county. Most of them. The more urbanized counties in Florida are charter counties, and basically what that means is that there is a, a charter, which is like a little constitution for that area, and it is really the rule book for how that charter works, which means that when um, in Orange County, if there's something that either the current commission and mayor want to change or the citizens want to change, they address it in their charter. and so. If it's not something that has been already um, addressed by the state or federal government, it's on. It's it's not off limits, and the, and the charter for the county can really address that. And why why that's important, and why charter counties really were identified as a tool for Florida counties, is because Florida is so diverse from top to bottom, and the idea of of each county in its own. Um, form of government being able to identify what works best for that county, I feel like was such a great benefit. It is such a great benefit to our state, and the idea that those charters have been hemmed more and more as the years go on should really alarm you because what that means is that it's not the people who are living in your down the street from you, the people who are breathing the same air as you, making those decisions. So I know I been a broken record about this, but ask when, you know, when you go to vote for your governor and your state lawmaker, ask them if they voted for, uh, or if they approved of a preemption bill that would take away those local rights, because it is something that will, you know, potentially affect your health and safety. And that is a constitutionally given um, duty of, of local government, is to protect the health, health and safety of its citizens. But there's even more than just water on this petition that you're focusing on. She's got on. us back again. <laughs> so good. She's so you good. You know, you know, Lee, uh, could you follow my wife and I around the house? And <laughs> I get literally back to the point. So let's get let's get back to the point. If we had a couple glasses of wine, it would be a different story. <laughs> We'd be here for four you know, hours. I think that would be a good ha happy hour. Happy hour, happy with, happy with, hour with Commissioner Wilson. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> um, I wish I had brought a bottle now. No, but uh, yes, there are. There are four more constitutional amendments. And all five, you can read about all five at the website, fl5.org, mm -hmm. like florida5.org. Uh, the second one is the Florida Iconic Species Amendment, mm -hmm. in, in no particular order. And what that does is we. Kind of like the Florida Department of, of Environmental Protection, in 1998, we set up this Florida Wildlife Conservation Commission. And uh, that conservation has been left out. Uh, and it has developed into a, a private hunting club. Yeah, it's really a hard and, thing to watch. And uh, what, what we're trying to do with that amendment is to create a new class of iconic species, the 10 different species of animals that are off limits for the Wildlife Commission to issue hunting permits on. It also protects their habitat. So I don't know if you remember in 2015, 
we had a, uh, a gratuitous hunt of the Florida black bear, and uh, the 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 entire Tragic. state came, you know, was was absolutely horrified by the pictures that they saw and the sounds that they saw and what came out of that. And they said, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, ninety some percent of the uh, comments were against having a hunt. So. They haven't had one since, but every year we go through the same thing. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're thinking about having a hunt, and then people have to show up and say, no, no, no. And then they say, okay, we won't do it this year. But uh, a year after year, we get into this, uh, this thing. And the other thing is we're having uh, this problem of species being downlisted. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an organization that uh, recently made public comment uh, saying that uh, we don't need these kind of rights of nature laws. Uh, what we need to do is continue to downlist all these uh, endangered species. The, floor, the, the manatee was recently downlisted. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, here's, here's a species that's really taken it on the chin, and, and now they, they have less protection than they had a couple of years ago. And if it's okay, I'm going to frame this a little bit. Just because there are different levels of protection and in the highest level of protection is under the endangered species act but florida also has a protected species classification and unfortunately under the protected species classification the ability to go from protected to hunted is is rapid and under the endangered species act if they're able to make make it into that classification protections are greater and it really makes more sense because you need data in order to get to any assumptions about a population, you need data. And anybody that's done any research at all or, or looked up things, you understand that the data on a species requires entire reproductive cycles. So there, you know, this isn't something that you can say, well, there were three seen in a neighborhood. Clearly, that means that the population is healthy. Well, no, what that means is we moved into another bear neighborhood yeah. and that we're not doing a good job of securing mm -hmm. our garbage cans. And, and you know, so, the human conduct is a completely different conversation and i think it's a good conversation to have and that we have an obligation to be you know good neighbors if we're going to be neighbors and and i mean that as in put your dog food away close up your garbage make sure that you take responsibility for the human effects that you're that you're putting out there mm -hmm. and then on a separate side of that understand that when there's data that's looked at to determine if something is you know viable for a hunt but that data is oftentimes really anecdotal and very subjective so these iconic species these are things that as a floridian when they're gone they're gone there's not another place that we can go get them mm -hmm. and yeah. with, with them losing their habitat at the bare minimum we can put something in our constitution that says these creatures are ours to protect and to watch over mm -hmm. and so you know that is sort of the crux of this um and i to me this well said well it said. just seems like it was so long overdue there's been such frustration on the delisting of of protected species and and what that really means and you know so i i to see this in writing in the way that it looks i i got very emotional yeah. because I think we all we all have an understanding of our role in, in protecting these species. I mean, yeah. I thought it made common sense. I mean, you see all the development everywhere. There needs to be something in place to protect these species that in many cases are even endemic to this state yeah. only. Mm -hmm. You can't right. find mm -hmm. them anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's it's just because the protections aren't there, they're, they're getting overlooked. Well, you know, um, I had an interesting conversation with Clay Henderson, who is the attorney who drafted yes. this amendment back in 1998 when he was on the uh, state uh, uh, constitutional revision commission. And that happens every 20 years. And I asked him, I said, what, what do you think of your, your brainchild mm -hmm. now? What's your current opinion? And he said, Chuck, this commission is 180 degrees from what I initially had intended. 
and unfortunately that's what happens sometimes. Uh, this was intended to be a non-politicized, mm -hmm. science-driven entity, and what it's become is it's a, a, a plum appointment for major donors to the gubernatorial uh, campaign of, uh, for instance, the, the current governor. Uh, you give heavily. It's the number two sought after appointed wow. position. So what do we have up there now? We have, uh, you know, developers uh, extraordinaire. Um, you know, we have people who benefit from the destruction of the habitat. Um, th these are not people <clears throat> who should be in charge of our wildlife in the state of Florida. Yeah. So that that's the second uh, uh, amendment, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we'll go go uh, into the third. And I mean, we could just cut me off when you. <clears throat> no, we right gotta there. do this. I'm, this I'm, is, yeah, I'm talking this is too much about five. these, but these are these are like uh, like ch uh, my children. Yes. Uh, the the third one is the the Wetlands Protection Act, which makes it uh, illegal to dredge and fill wetlands in the state of Florida. You might say, "Wow, that's that's pretty extreme." But our, our wetlands are like our kidneys. Mm -hmm. uh, for our rivers, uh, our streams, our lakes. We need those wetlands. They absorb the okay. nitrates and phosphates. They're solar powered yeah. because the sun comes and, uh, you know, Extremely it efficient. The planet. They're ext <laughs> they, they've existed for tens of thousands of years without any energy uh, input from us. All we have to do is not destroy them, right? What a deal. We have these great. We have these amazing um, ecosystems that have so many functions that help us in the long run, and if, we're what? All we have to do is not destroy them, <laughs> right? So Florida has more wetlands than any other state, and we've already uh, lost half of our wetlands to developers. So they've been paved Chuck, over. This is, yeah. what? So you should just put a desk in here. And I don't know if you guys work can out hear my blood pressure going up on this conversation because every day, and every that, day, somebody wants to and fill one in. And right? it's really, really, really frustrating that within the way that we review any any application that comes in, it's it's reviewed in its singular application so that there's no holistic view of mm. what we're giving mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. there's no global view of how much exactly we're giving up in wetlands and this idea that we trade them off for a mitigation credit somewhere in i don't know lake county we don't know i don't know. i've looked at some of them and i'm like i think i thought we already had that as a conservation area yeah. and what is this even it's a shell game so mm -hmm. Those are the best protection we have for yeah. all the water issues going on. I mean, District 1, it, we, would you say it's the top call we get? Mm -hmm. we that have, and flooding. Flooding, which is what we're talking about here. Right. We give up our kidneys. Mm -hmm. You know, you've seen somebody whose kidneys are failing. They swell. You cannot have that. This is what keeps our, it's a sponge, it's a buffer, it's a cleaner, a filter. And, and we can't. We can't give them all up and expect the right. water that we have running off these impervious surfaces to just. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say that, you know, we've donated one kidney to developers. <laughs> we can't afford to kidney. donate the other one, one, right? Absolutely. So uh, that, that is what, one of the uh, really, really fundamental things that we need to change. Because as, as you said, <clears throat> they're viewed microscopically yes. as, okay, so There's we're a losing an acre here. A quarter acre, two acres there, yeah. five acres there. And, and the reality is that these developments could exist with those wetlands in place. Yes. The, the, almost all these parcels have uplands property right. that you could build on, build your office building, build your warehouse, but just leave leave the wetlands Chuck, alone. That would require a determination of those wetlands before we move further in the planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we, here, we get the plan in, then we look for the wetlands. And then, now we have a reason to say, we're gonna have to mitigate. 
Yeah. Well, so determine where they are. Let's yeah. get an inventory. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. set them aside and just mm -hmm. say, yeah, you know what? Out of your 10 acres, we know four for sure are going to be wetland. Do whatever you want with the rest of it. Make sure we've got our buffer. Let's right. see as well. It's not the way we're doing it. The way we're doing it is we get a plan in. It takes up nine acres. We say, let's go in there and see mm -hmm. what this uh, conservation area determination, what's, what's, gonna, what's the impact going to be. We come back and we say four. Oh my gosh, they're class one. We can't do that. The developer says, well, you've already let me get to stage five here. Do you know how much this has cost? That looks like a reasonable now um, applicant request to make sure that they are able to mitigate. Yeah. And it happens again and again and again. And I said, this is a broken process that we're not getting the determination first. Yeah. We should never have anything as commissioners that come to us for a vote that we have an incomplete determination. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, it's, I, I'm not sure if people understand what I'm saying. I know mm -hmm. you do. I know you do. Mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, the more that I try to explain it, I'm hopefully I'm getting some traction. Uh -huh. But this is not a complex issue. We're not taking away anyone's property rights. What mm -hmm. we're doing is we're determining the way that property looks before we ever hit the next step. You know, and there's no reason. We've got GIS now. We can do this. Yes. This is not rocket science. But it sounds like there's two different things that are being looked at here at the same time. It sounds like you're looking at legal protections oh, yeah. for wetlands, but you're saying that the process of approval could have some steps this, prior in, to... And this is a defense of the idea that this isn't going to affect property rights that we can protect wetlands and property rights. Because there's this really, there's a narrative where you hear this sort of private property rights tug of war. I'm like, these are not mutually exclusive things. We're literally protecting your property by keeping a wetland. Yeah. And, and that, if you if you go to fl5.org and read the, the full text of that uh, wetlands amendment, we talk about private property rights, and mm -hmm. we're saying in order to secure private yes. property rights, mm -hmm. we're not going to let people destroy these wetlands right. anymore. Because in your district, even even the uh, attorney who was on the Charter Review Commission uh, lives in a neighborhood that's being flooded out yes. because somebody filled in wetlands yes. near him. So, uh, you know, this is not something that's yes. remote, it's right. you know, th e ethereal, theoretical. No, this is it's water happening. and it's flooding people's houses. Yeah. Uh, it, it, beyond all the good things that wetlands do, the filtration, the, the uh, wildlife habitat, all, all these other things. So what, what this would do is, is put a hard stop, a hard stop on filling in these wetlands before they're all gone. And the other, the other part of it is these wetlands uh, not only filter water that goes in the surface water, they filter groundwater also, so that the water going into the Florida aquifer is clean. And this is what 90% of us in Florida are drinking from are from aquifers. So, uh, you know, if we want to continue expanding and growth and the, you know that term growth is like is that growth now it's not really growth it's destruction but let's just let's go along with the term growth if we want to continue growth we're going to have to continue having a source of water for the people who are living in that in that neighborhood and in order to do that we have to preserve these mm -hmm. uh, wetlands that are are, are are feeding water down uh, into the Florida aquifer mm -hmm. and enabling us all all to live here but uh you know the these these issues that we're talking about are rarely talked about because they are they're they're, they're long-term views mm -hmm. and it, in the short term you, you get these applications to fill in and then we're, we're also dealing with at, at the county level cities yeah. that annex these wetlands because they have no protection for wetlands. Oh, that's right. Developers have learned that there's a, a workaround, right? That you can get annexed and that the development process that requires the the review that I'm describing, right. Right. It, they don't go through that. They go through the um, whatever the water management district is. And if there is some, some decision that's come down from the Army Corps, but there, those aren't actual wetland you know evaluations mm -hmm. in the way that that our charter lays out. 
So yeah. you're exactly right, and it's something that um, that I have, you know, been trying to really uncover the way that we can fix because I think that um, once again, the much the way that we talk about the state being the floor, yeah, and then you know, counties should be able to increase the level of protections um, that the county is the floor, and the state should be able to increase the level of protections, but they shouldn't be able to go under that. And right. so that is something that has been a, a, a really priority for me that, you know, we're continuing to try to um, mm -hmm. advance. And I know that there's longstanding historical connections between the city of Orlando and Orange County, but our charter is our little constitution. So if we're following that, that's, that is something mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. that we're allowing to happen. It's contrary to our charter. Sure, sure. I'm sure that there's jurisdictional issues in almost every single one of these, but you brought up growth. And there was something that really stood out to me about the toll road expansion because that is where jurisdictions cross over lines and makes things very complicated to target like mm -hmm. who is the, the source of the problem so maybe you can right. talk a little bit about that the uh, fourth amendment <laughs> we is, we're almost there we're almost there yeah we're almost there the fourth amendment uh says that in the state of florida you can no longer build a toll road through conservation land or rural uh, land. So there's a definition for rural land in there as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is uh, these toll roads have become a new favorite toy of the development community where they can buy uh, a few thousand acres of cow pasture out in the middle of nowhere and then get a toll agency because a lot of them they donate heavily to to run a highway out to their their cow pasture to make their property more valuable and the reason why they use a toll road is nobody has to pay for it up front they sell bonds and those bonds they use the money from the sale of the bonds to build the toll road and we're talking about very very hundreds of millions of dollars that that normally the, a county would never allow because they don't have the money to build right. highways to nowhere and that's what we're, we're talking about is highways to nowhere highways to nowhere that bisect communities bisect bio you know wildlife corridors wildlife corridors it, they destroy the nature of of communities especially uh, rural communities there's a case up in the uh, ocala area you know, they have all these great horse farms and they want to run a, uh, a toll road through there that would uh, uh, destroy, you know, the next thing you run a toll road through and you put it in an interchange at a, at a, at a, a road and then the next thing that happens is all those horse farms disappear and you see uh, housing development yeah. after housing development mm -hmm. and it's sprawl. And, and, that's really what we're talking about here is how's Florida going to grow? Are we going to continue to sprawl? Are we going to have what I call the villagization of Florida, where it's one mega sprawling uh, suburban bedroom community, a bedroom community from, from one coast to the other? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to preserve these things, mm -hmm. the, the, these wild lands, that, uh, these springs? The reason why a lot of us moved here and the reason why uh, a lot of us stay here is that Florida is different than any other state in the union. And we have to preserve what's mm -hmm. special about it and not just become South New Jersey. But, right? Well, yeah. and I think it's very interesting because we've had many conversations with people here about also the benefit of, of good location of density anyway, right? Because if you're gonna go with a higher density area somewhere that there's not good transportation, that there's not good jobs, they haven't built a school yet, then the quality of life is diminished for all. So, you know, when we look at those densities, we really need to hone in on making sure that where we decide to have a higher density is exactly where we've got good transit and where we have, you know, a, a school with with availability in it and, and, and economic drivers. So that all those things that work here, play here, school here, happen that's a quality of life for for everyone you know right. and so once again there's not a tension with you know that the the commerce the economic drivers because we're talking about quality of life across the board yeah yeah mm -hmm. and 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 that's such an important point because these 
these um, mega communities that spring up in these cow pastures. Uh, we, the citizens who are here now, we're the ones that have to pay yeah. for the roads. We, we pay for the police, we pay for the fire department, we pay for the schools for this new mega community out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we pay for their water, we pay for their sewer. You know, they, While they, our infrastructure needs that investment. Uh, and yeah, we, we need the money here. And, and the other thing is, when that toll road does not have the ridership that they initially said that it was gonna have, it's the tolls on the people who live here who use, for instance, the uh, 408 or the 417. Those tolls go up. You know, uh, Lee, I'm sure you've seen that, that our, our, our uh, uh, toll agency here, Central Florida Expressway, they encourage you, get a, get a sun pass, get an e-pass. Well, yes, that's for your convenience too, but they keep hiking up to pay for these yeah, looser the that toll roads, that we the, the, the roads to nowhere, yeah. and, and, and we never know it. Right. All we see is well, we don't have any charge. choices, though. So this is, you know, the thing, the, the conversation recently about Brightline and and being able to take some, uh, having some choices, some transit options, and the idea that CFX is going to charge a private entity, Brightline, mm -hmm. for removing ridership, even though really we should be rewarding Brightline for protecting our roadways from further wear and tear, and our environment from further carbon emissions. You know, mm. it's such a backward, it's so backwards. And mm -hmm. I think the, um, luckily this is, that is a private project and I think it's gonna go forward and hopefully, you know, they, the groups that killed other mass transit, you know, will be appeased because they have some more options with a private entity. But, but this idea that, that somehow, you know, the toll road is inevitability of our lives because yeah. we don't have, we don't have any other options. So. Yeah. yeah, and it, one, one of the things about this is it, it doesn't uh, limit the expansion, like the widening of right. current toll roads. What we're talking about here is, is saying, okay, we have these toll roads, we'll widen them, uh, but we're not going to branch out into these, these uh, highways to nowhere. In and, rural and, and protected rural. areas where right. really, you know, the coast communities, when MCORS was on the table, those communities were were bracing themselves for complete devastation. Yeah. Um, because nobody asked them. <laughs> no, nobody asked them. Nobody so. asked for that whole thing, except for maybe a couple developers who had plans yeah. for a bunch of uh, land that they bought on the cheap, and they wanted to get uh, a highway system to that community, and and that's. You know that goes back to your uh, your patches, right? Yes. If if you had to, you know, create the patch as big as the donation, that's what I'm saying. A lot of these people they don't have the body space <laughs> to hold <laughs> the, all the patches. All the sponsors. All the they sponsors. Have on their shirts, and, all the legislative. Yeah, I mean, you know, sponsorships. <laughs> our, our governor, even though he is growing in width, <laughs> he's trying to maintain uh, enough room for all those patches. But uh, there is a Fifth Amendment. Okay, we're getting there. I'm okay. sorry. I know I get very excited about. Uh, we have a, there, we're educating. We haven't been able to get. There is a Fifth Amendment, and that is a ban on captive wildlife hunting in the state of Florida. Is that a problem? I didn't. Well, you know, uh, most of the people I talked to had no idea that it's even legal here. But let me let me tell you what it is first. I was going to say maybe explain this one a little yeah. bit because uh, in the state of Florida. Let's say you buy some uh, a forest uh, land, and you know it could be five thousand acres, it could be ten thousand acres. There's no cap now on the amount of land, and you want to hold it until you can sell it to a developer. So what they what they do is they put a fence around an eight foot high fence, and then bring in exotic wildlife, and this could be animals from zoos that they buy at. Uh, oh auction gosh. or whatever gazelles or whatever and they could come from you know places that that you don't really uh, know like bush gardens for instance you know the petting zoo if an animal grows up they want to you know cash in or whatever uh, and they can sell it at these wildlife auctions so they go to these captive hunting farms where you can sell the head of this gazelle 
oh. to somebody. They get in the golf cart, they drive out to the corner where they all are like huddled and shoot one. And, you know, is that sport? Oh, that's uh, cool. it, it's So there are over 200 of these facilities in the state of Florida. Now, here's the good, here's the good part of this. And I was talking to somebody who was uh, trying to relate to me that uh, these captive wildlife hunting farm owners are not happy with me. Right. Oh, and, uh, you know, get to, in line to, to, <laughs> the, to the point You're cutting of, into their profit margins, to, of to course. The, well, I mean, for to your point about a lot of people not knowing about this, no, the idea that they you don't can know. get animals that have been captive their whole lives. So they don't have any of their instinctual fear. None. They're being fed. So they don't right. have any of hand the drive fed. to hand fed any mm -hmm. of the drive to try to to really behave like wild animals. But then you let someone come in, you take their money, and you send them out there to hunt them. So yeah, they're basically hunt. like shooting a pet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's, yeah. Like um, it's like shooting a pet. It's like shooting a pet. Orange County offers free mental health for anyone who's interested <laughs> in shooting exotic animals. Yeah. Um, in somebody else's and, backyard. And, yeah. And, mental health counseling, District 1 at OCFL. And, and, and they, they sell these for like an extraordinary amount of money too, like, like $7,500 for... Uh, you know, this gazelle or whatever uh, mounted So, and the you. person who does the hunting, and I'm really saying that very loosely, brings home this trophy from just a different county and puts it on the wall as though they had been to some exotic locale. And... Oh, yeah, yeah. And they could tell whatever story they, they okay. wanted to about it. But here's, Nulo, here's the good Nulo. <laughs> here's the good point. Okay, and I was t telling you, I was talking to this guy who's uh, kind of was telling me their side of the story. I said, well, what if... We actually put the Amendment 1 money that we passed in 2014 and bought out yes, bought really. out these 5,000 acres, you know, 10,000, and, and it would double the size of our state park system. And I live next to uh, Wakaiva State Park, Wakaiva Springs State Park, and every weekend there's a line of cars. It, it gets to maximum capacity. There's a line of cars of people waiting. Again. Wouldn't it be great if we, so doubled, if we doubled our state park system and gave people an alternative place to go to, to bring their kids, yeah. et cetera. Because we are, we're running out of wild spaces. Right. And, and you know, you want kids to grow up with, uh, surrounded by at least an opportunity to go out for a walk in the woods or right. whatever, and not, not continually, you know, play in a parking lot for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So, so here's a chance uh, by voting for this, by putting it on the ballot, to uh, quite possibly double the size of our state park system. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think Great that idea. would be uh, a big benefit to all Floridians. Even economically as well, because yep. rec you know, recreation is oh, an I, economic I think driver. All of the, once again, that's a quality of life thing. Quality of life for the, you know, for the residents who don't have those wild places to go, but also quality of life for the animals that are currently mm -hmm. really suffering in these places. Mm -hmm. um, so did we get all five? Can we do a recap? That's all, that's all five. Mm -hmm. Okay, go Let's ahead. Let's do a recap. Right? This is We've a got test. Right this to clean test. water. we got the right to clean water near and dear. Mm -hmm. Florida iconic species near and dear. They're all right. near and dear. I can't yeah. do this. Right? Right? <laughs> if you asked me to put them in order, I would be really hard pressed. Yeah. Like some importance, yeah. I'd be like, I, they're all so equal. Yeah. Um, wetlands uh, protection. Um, we've got the, the toll roads. Uh, no toll roads to nowhere. Yeah. Right. And of course the um, captive hunting. How? What is the? What is the title of that one? Captive so the, wildlife hunting ban. Captive. Ca oh, captive know. wildlife. I, it hunting makes me ban. get like very. Um, I get kind of nauseous thinking about that. Like it really is a very yeah. visceral reaction yeah. to this I, idea. I don't think, you know, of all the people I've talked to. I don't think there's one person that actually knew that that was legal in the state yeah, of Florida. No way. Um, I didn't know there was 200 either. That just two, sounds... Oh, oh, it's is there that many people that are disturbed enough well, mentally to think well, that that is a, I think a pleasure? To, is that a point, though, some of those, they're, they're sort of holding onto that property anyway. So it's their, it's giving them a, a double use for a, an investment property or they're... Yeah trying to, you know, leverage it in whatever way they can. Boy, what an unethical way to leverage that property. Yeah. You know, and you think about a place that could really be a, a wildlife preserve. You know, you think yeah. about so many. You know, it, it, if, why not open one with, uh, where you could chase developers with a paintball gun? <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Would that, would that be a good one? Let's start one. I, I don't see any reason um, why not to. I think, I think that would sell tickets. <laughs> So <laughs> that could happen in the halls around here sometimes. <laughs> so I know everybody's burning to know and everybody's like, they're itching to know how do they get on board? Where do they find more information and what are the action items that they need to take home after today? Sure. Uh, please go to the website, fl5.org. Uh, you can download the petitions. There are three different ways. You can download them individually. You mm -hmm. can, uh, get them all at one time and you can also autofill your name address date of birth on all five so that you don't have to do you know write that out you know, five times just date it sign it put it in an envelope and mail it now lee you know i know this is your next question is uh, for your generation yes. why can't you do this online and I get that question. question yes. I get that question from people under the age of 35, let's say, all the time. Why can't we do this online? Why uh -huh. can't we? Why in this like? Why don't you do it like Change.org? Well, this is what is in the Florida statute. Right. This is how you get something on the ballot. If we could have done it through like a Change.org, believe me. <laughs> we would have done it that way. But the good thing is you can go and digitally download it. So yes. this isn't something that we have to mail out, right? That's, I mean, we mail it back in. We mail it back in. Residents but you don't have to request in, but you it. you just get it. Yeah. But you just pull it down, print it off. Print it out. Um, I, just, I know that there's, you have volunteers. There's volunteers all over the state that are getting out to events, and I'm sure that's oh. going to continue to happen. Yes. I, I, I can feel the momentum of this because... Obviously, right now, there are people grieving up and down the state of Florida for what's happening in our coastline without even really getting to the conversation of what's happening in the interior. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think that mm. this is the, the timing mm. is is essential. Yeah. And I think we are we owe it to future generations. We owe it to the, you know, things that can't speak for themselves. And so yeah. so I do want to show really quickly. I know it's kind of probably hard to see, but this is the way one of the ballots looks if you print it off. All five of them need to be done separately. The language, um, ballot title, and summary is right at the top so you know which ones you've done. Um, put your voter registration number in. I know that we're, there's been some changes in sort of the way that they're looking at allowing these ballot measures to come forward. Do you anticipate extra scrutiny? Is there a, do we need to keep a, uh, is there a, a date we need to circle? that yeah. we should let everyone know about. Yeah, uh, they all have to be turned in by November 30th of this year. Uh, and we need 900,000, which sounds like a lot, but we do have 21.5 million people in the state and roughly, uh, I don't know, 60, 65% of those mm -hmm. are, are registered to vote. Um, so. It is doable. We can do this. Uh, it, we're less than 60 days out, and, and you said, can, can they change this? We came out with this after the legislature ended uh, their session this time, because we knew if we started before, there they, would, they okay. would throw some curveball at right. us. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's, it's uh, uh, late to start, but there's a reason why it, it was late to start, because we already it's know what they're you don't, doing. Right, knowing that, that the, sad situation to think that if a resident, if residents and, and concerned humans are trying to put something on the ballot, which is a very American thought, a very American idea, that the people that you elected, which means you hired them, can make sure that doesn't happen. And I, I, that's another one of those that I find is so um, completely contrary to our democratic principles, right? We want something on the ballot and there's enough people who want that on the ballot. It should be there. And then once those things pass, they should be honored. Mm -hmm. And so your, you know, your constitutional amendments, and I, I don't, I don't really lightly go into the idea of voting to add something to our constitution, mm -hmm. but when there is a gaping hole in our law mm -hmm. and our lawmakers have mm -hmm. not been able to help and have in fact been really a part of the problem, then it's on us. It's on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And none of these, just, just to, if people were to say, well, why don't you get them passed those laws? None of these would ever pass in this legislature. And uh, there, these are things that need immediate attention. 
we can't wait. Uh, we're about to go through another redistricting process, so the legislature is only going to get more uh, prohibitive of this type. Prohibitive, of exactly. And believe me, next session there's going to be a whole new set of restrictions on doing constitutional amendments. Yeah. Uh, so now's the time. Also, if you if you would like to, you can go to click on the Join Us button at the FL5 and uh, sign up to be an ambassador. We have ambassadors all over the state. These uh, uh, folks uh, are so full of enthusiasm. You'll see them at, at farmer's markets. You'll see them at libraries getting signatures on, on these ballots because we're doing that as well as the online uh, to get to the 900,000. And it. I know that... Uh, so it's a heavy lift, but it's very doable. I love when, when, you know, I look at some of the people that have been really involved in the Right to Clean Water um, initiative and, and legis legislative pushes, that these are people who were really boots on the ground, mm -hmm. um, people who have, you know, fishing captains and um, resort owners in areas that are waterfront, um, you know, kayakers and people who were watching this impairment happen and, you know, with no ability to do anything to stop or change it. So mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, kind of a nice thing also if you step up and volunteer to get to meet some of the people who were really there from, from the beginning and oh, yeah. what their paths were like and what their experiences are. You know, it's yes. always make it friends when you jump in on one of these things. Yeah, I, and uh, I heard from uh, somebody who's running for uh, the U.S. Senate uh, in the primary, and he, he, I met him a month or so ago, didn't hear back from him, and he texted me uh, yesterday and said, wow, we're hearing from your, uh, meeting your ambassadors all over the state. Mm -hmm. He said, well, what an energetic group of people you, you have there. And I'm like, this is what's driving. This is what's driving all, the, all five. And, uh, you know, there are some people who are more driven. For instance, animal advocates, they're more driven to the two that, that pertain to animals. There's some people who live on the coast. They're more drawn to it. But I, 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 I try to say, okay, let's, instead of, Looking at uh, tunnel vision, which environmentalists often we get into yes. these this tunnel vision, our our, our own silo. Yep. You know, I'm concerned about this. You know, let's just go uh, lock arms. That's right. All 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 environmentalist group and take one giant step forward. And, and they're all connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you they if are. you think that the the you know the the welfare of marine animals is your only concern, but you're not paying attention to what's happening to our wetlands, then you know there's. Or if you, you know, if there's, if I think about, you know, we have some really amazing people in the area that are climate activists, and I think, okay, you know what, that's going to require us protecting the biodiversity sure. of our state. So all those things are interconnected. So, I, you know, yeah. I think that, I think the idea of having all five, mm -hmm. um, you know, in one place, people can go download, print, mail them in. It just makes the most sense in, yeah. in making sure it's addressing you know, the domino effect of, of the destruction in, in, in what we're trying to make sure we're doing is protecting. And I think it's a, I'm very, I'm so proud of, of being in Orange County where this was born That's in, true. you know, Florida and seeing, and I'm so proud of residents and voters here for paying attention. I was really annoyed, you know, right after the election, people were like, well, they don't know what they were voting for. I'm like, you can say that if that was like a 52%. Yeah, maybe right. sixty. You don't right. say they didn't know what they were right. voting about yeah. at eighty-nine yeah. percent. These yeah. are people who knew, yeah. and yeah. it is something that is bipartisan. We all want these things, so um, it's very exciting to talk about it. And I hope that we can continue to do updates and great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you see as sort of the big, the biggest challenges at the time that we have on the calendar? Well, uh, the first hurdle is to get to two hundred twenty-two thousand, mm -hmm. and uh, this is another thing that the legislature used to be. If you get ten percent of the necessary, then you go in front of the uh, Florida Supreme Court. So mm -hmm. they, they uh, tested the, the language and they're, they, you know, they're looking for issues at the, uh, the Florida Supreme Court. So we need to get to, in front of the uh, Supreme Court and get to that 222,000 first and then uh, get to 900,000 uh, submitted by 
November 30th of this year. And I, I just, I don't know, I, I, it's just kind of like the Orange County Amendment. People are like, what, are you crazy? You know, this is crazy. And then it passed by 89%. Well, they read re yeah. You know, I would challenge anybody who thinks that, on, you know, on by just hearing this today or maybe just kind of glancing at me a social media post, that yeah. it's something that seems sort of out there. Read it. It makes the most sense yeah. as yeah. far as... Um, you know, really putting it back into voters' hands. That's all that this is doing, right? This doesn't it pass it. This puts it in voters' hands, so they yeah. can, so people can go to the polls and decide if it's something that Florida needs. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, for those of you that might want to have a little bit more of a hands-on opportunity to get involved, uh, definitely check out fl5.org if you want to become an ambassador. One of our ambassadors that we know who works with this office, uh, Casey Pietro from Ideas for Us. Uh, she's helping to do uh, educational events. You can go to ideasforus.org and look at some of the social media. There is an environmental leadership meeting coming up on Monday, the 26th at 6 p.m., where we'll have a bunch of these printed out, and we'll be talking about a lot of other things coming down the line. But we need to get these signatures, so please help us with some sweat equity. We can even go door to door. And if you have any questions about it, reach out. This is, you know, the part that I love. We dig in and, you know, find out if there's any case law out there, and you know, what kind of, uh, you know, just throw us your questions. I love, I love having a discussion. Awesome. Do we have any questions, Ernest? We have one question. John Foster says, "How many millions of gallons are taken from Florida daily by bottled water?" Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's. A, I don't yeah. know the answer to that question. I know that uh, the Nestle permit, it, uh, I believe it was Jenny Springs, was a, a, a big topic. Yeah. But, um, you know, one of the rights in the right to clean water is the right to flow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all those people who are very, very passionate about that, they ended up uh, disappointed because they tried to block the permit, the, there was a lawsuit, the, uh, uh, the, the Water Management District granted the permit at the end. Um, this allows individuals to bring an action on behalf of the river, mm -hmm. on behalf of the springs, to say you're violating the right to flow. Right. And, and knowing have that standing. is this life-sustaining, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a life-sustaining source of water for us. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me that that needed, that that, that needed uh, something yeah. for us. There sure. was a gap there, but for, you know, I've, I've said this, I don't know, a thousand times that our law was really just set up for, you know, sort of these compartmental ideas. And I right. believe the reason why that permit was given the way it was is because somebody has, you know, a deed to the little square around that spring, yeah. not knowing, not understanding the impact that giving away whatever bubbles up from there um, would be so impactful to all of us. And mm -hmm. so it's really reframing the way we look at that type of law. Well, thank you so much for coming and explaining this entire process. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to district1 at ocfl.net. Do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to share with people? Uh, I, I think, you know, this is a great place, a great forum, because Commissioner Wilson was very instrumental in the development of the right to clean water in Orange County, coming to the meetings, proposing language, uh, helping write the proposal in the first place. I think uh, e even uh, sharing a campaign sign got to be a, 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 a an issue that really uh, clean water Wilson. I was about to say. I was about to say <laughs> yeah. they don't call her clean water That's Wilson right. for nothing. Clean water. Right. You know, it's like okay, call me names, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm pulling my arm here. Like, that was a tough one. What was the other one? The greeny, I think. Uh, the green, and I'm like, it's good. I'll take it. Whatever. Uh, you know, it's, that's that's bad, it. That's I'm a bad thing. It. All right. Well, that's we're, right. We're, we're Let that be the. Uh... I, I think. I think that even in the gubernatorial race. Uh, now, uh, Charlie Crist has endorsed the right to clean water wow. statewide. Wow. So, we're, you know, we went from zero to 60 days, and we're already an issue in the gubernatorial race. Okay. You know, I, even when the, the preemption language, which was devastating that we started to see, you know, in that ridiculous law, um, it felt like 
we were making progress in a way because oh, yeah. if they're if they're trying to keep the control from the people who live here then then that means that it's being heard it's effective and that it's resonating with residents all over mm -hmm. and right. so you know we just need to keep up that that momentum and the understanding that this is something that affects you your backyard you should have the control over it and that you should have the right to take this to the ballot and decide mm -hmm. well thank you all so much please sign your petitions and send them in and if you have any questions let us know have a wonderful weekend thank you bye, bye.